Um, it's going to be brief. Um, I just wanted to thank Neil for, for coming. Um, we, when I was working on uh, 10 years and more ago, when we were working on the book High Water, um, I worked, went to his office and he had some incredible um, materials there. And so um, when we were putting together this talk, I said, we have to have Neil you know, come and help. Um, and I will also be shunting any difficult questions that way. So, um, so I'm lucky enough to live near the Fraser. It's a part of my life. Um, I cross it and recross it every day. And I was also lucky enough about 10 years ago to be asked by a group of farmers to write a history of flooding in the Fraser Valley um, because they were concerned that the knowledge of the... Um, of the uh, challenges of living on the Fraser w was being lost as they, as people had experienced, particularly the flood of 1948, sort of g aged out of government, especially, and aged out of communities. And they were worried that this, that was that was going to be lost. Um, and so that was the genesis for that book. Um, they say that you know people in the past had a water consciousness that is not necessarily the same today, and we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. Um, when we're talking about managing um, flood control infrastructure over time, which is what this talk is about, we're, we're talking about a dynamic natural system, um, which Neil knows so well, um, but we're also talking about a whole complex of really deeply human uh, systems and, and, um, and sort of contexts, so that as you're trying to manage this dynamic uh, natural system, you're also um, dealing with legislation, policy, financial commitment from all different kinds of um, places. Um, and also the, our treatment of the river and of flood control infrastructure at least to mid-century and beyond was really deeply connected to um, history and so that, that's the kind of connection with this work. So um, that's a brief welcome and now Neil's going to do that. Oh. So, just in terms of the talk, um, we'll be talking a little bit about settlement <clears throat> era history and the flood of 1948. Neil's going to talk about today's context in terms of governments and the current status of debt protection. Um, and then the future, there's some future considerations which are inflecting policy nowadays. And then we'll wrap up. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so thanks, Jane, very much for uh, in, inviting me here. And uh, it's no coincidence that a water resource engineer is interested in history. Um, the water measurements, the history of floods, um, that's basically the basis for hydrology. So um, we're historical engineers by, by, by uh, nature. Um, so first of all, uh, I'll just give you a bit of an introduction, very brief, to the Fraser River flood hazard from a hazard perspective. Um, the watershed extends all the way up north of Prince George into the Rocky Mountain Trench. It, it drains more than a quarter of the whole area of BC, including Vancouver Island. And um, it's, it's a big river. I mean, it's not as big as the Amazon or anything, but um, just a couple of points. Uh, the 1894 design flow that, that is the current uh, standard is 10 times the peak flow of the Bow River in Calgary in June 2013. So you might have images of that. So the Fraser in flood is 10 times that big. And it's larger also than the Mississippi River design flow at St. Louis. That's sort of the Midwest state. So it's, it's a big river. Um, and major floods are caused by uh, combination of things. It's, a, it's actually a very complex watershed with lots of different components and a bunch of things have to happen to get a big flood. So big floods are pretty rare, but they can happen and they have happened. Um, but you need both snow melt uh, at, at a rapid rate and usually a bit of rain as well. So the, I think the best way to understand the flood hazard is to look at a hydrograph and, and for non-technical people, this is not very technical. It's just a graph of the flow of the river in cubic meters per second 
from zero to about 16,000 on, on, on the vertical. And then this is just basically from April 1st, just time to the end of July, um, which is basically the, the freshet period. And there's a bunch of interesting things that you can learn from looking at these graphs. I've, I've plotted the three biggest floods, um, or, or sorry, not the three biggest floods, but um, the star at the top there, that's our 1894 peak flow. We actually don't have a hydrograph for that flood. Uh, but the 1948 uh, in red, uh, the 1972 is the third largest in green there. And um, I've included a couple more recent floods, 2012 and 2014. And as of today, where the blue star is, we're at about 6,500. Uh, cubic meters per second at, at the gauge at Hope. And um, I think the, the thing to look at here is uh, look at the Fraser River as kind of a, could be an electrical system or something. You turn on the switch and then you turn off the switch and, this, and, and what turns on the switch is heat and what turns off the switch is cold, cold weather. And then you get a bit of rain like in 1972 you had the the, this last peak is a, is a rainfall peak rather than a snowmelt peak. Um, in 1948, if you go from uh, about nine or 10,000 where the river is flowing bank full, there's basically the threshold of flooding. So there's nothing really happening yet. Maybe a couple low-lying roads in Langley or something are closed, but nothing's really happening. Um, from there to the, the peak of the event is only five days. So for a large river, it's extremely rapid reacting. And uh, I think it has the potential to catch people off, off uh, you know, surprise people. Because it, it, five days is not a lot of time to deal with a, a major emergency on the, on the Fraser. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, that, I think that's, that's enough for that slide. It, so what's at risk? Uh, this is a map of the Fraser Valley and the light shaded areas are the floodplain. Um, there's a lot of floodplain. It's 75 square kilometers uh, that are mainly protected by dikes. There's a few undiked areas. Um, and there's uh, 500 kilometers of dikes and approximately 500,000 people uh, live and work in the floodplain. But of course, our area has all the major transportation routes, communications, uh, pipelines, railways, a uh, huge amount of infrastructure. Uh, the Fraser Basin Council recently did a fairly comprehensive uh, analysis of what would happen if the 1894 flood happened. And at the 2011 census kind of uh, state of development, and the number was between 20 and 30 billion dollars of, uh, of more or less direct uh, flood damage and, and immediate economic damage. Just to give you a, uh, an impression of, of what a big flood looks like, this is from 1948. It's basically valley wall to valley wall. We're looking uh, west over Nakoman Island where the dikes did fail. Um, and you can see Matsqui in the upper left area there and Hatsik on, on, on the right. <laughs> Another feature about the Fraser Valley is, is what we call the gravel reach. And it extends from about Hope down to just a little bit past the uh, Mission or around Mission area. And you can think of it as being a confined alluvial fan. It's sort of where the river comes out of a steep canyon spreads out a bit and it drops its sediment load. And over historical time, of course, the Fraser used to be from one valley side to the other. Um, now it's confined in a very narrow corridor by dikes. And so the sediment, none of the gravel basically gets past uh, Mission because the slope of the river uh, flattens out. So that you get this accumulation of material. And this leads to both uh, lateral erosion and uh, provides critical fish habitat and it also can lead to uh, changes in flood levels. How far out is the tide effect? Uh, the, a little bit past mission. 
If you look at the tide, the, the, the water level records for Mission, you see the little <coughs> daily tides. That tends to get flushed out a bit within the higher flows. So it's been a very controversial issue, and I, I could spend a whole hour uh, talking about sediment uh, issues, but uh, I, th I think sediment removal is not the solution to flooding. Um, it's a it's a relatively minor part of it, but it's something that can't be necessarily neglected. And over the long term, uh, there has probably has to be some sediment removed. But it, again, it's not the primary problem. Um, what is a critical problem in some areas, of course, is erosion. And this is Kerry Point uh, in Chilliwack here. And fortunately, the the dike of that location is set back. But um, a major, this is in the 90s, uh, BC Hydro lost a, a major hydro tower in that area. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the, uh, with respect to the hazard, is just to look a bit at the lower river, the, the, the uh, red lines on that little map there are, are uh, some of the dikes that uh, are designed for high sea levels and storm surge, high tides, as well as river flows. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to climate change. So Jane, back to you. <laughs> so um, I have about 10 minutes just to give you a picture of what the Fraser Valley was like. Um, a hundred and more years ago, and, and some of the underpinnings of the um, of the diking systems, and also the the thinking behind um, some of the diking and, and water management of the early part of the 20th century. Um, so the Fraser River is, as you can see by this 1876 map, it's, it has been described as the central fact of the Fraser Valley. Um, it was the link up and down the Fraser. Uh, you know the Fraser Valley. It was the locus of many points of connection. So rudiment in the 1860s and 70s, for example, rudimentary roads would go north and south, south to the river, and then the river was the main transportation corridor. Um, colonial policy was created in the 1860s and 1870s to ensure newcomers the uh, access to land and resources. Um, and so in this map here, you can see the evidence of the, that new geography of um, private property that's coming in, um, that this, the serving and settlement of First Nations land is displayed on this map. Um, there's a few, um, in, that, in that area, for example, there's a few uh, Indian reserves in Chilliwack marked on the map. Uh, 18, in Fraser Valley, the Indian reserves were pretty much set out in the 1860s, and by 18, in the 1870s, they only got smaller. Um, they were tended to be on the on the rivers because that was the kind of core of ancestral land. Um, the one thing that's really interesting about this map is is the large central feature of Sumas Lake in the middle. So right here, so Sumas Lake um, was a large. Sumas Lake was a large, um, large shallow lake. Um, marsh. Pardon? Oh, I heard the word marsh. A lot of people call it lake, but anyways, we can debate that later. Um, uh, in the Fraser Valley, it went from Sumas Mountain to Vetterman Mountain, and if you came, if you've come from uh, west, if you've come east from Vancouver, you've traveled across the corridor of that. This is one of my favorite pictures of Sumas Lake. It's Sumas Lake 1910. Um, it just shows you the, the kind of context of Sumas Lake. There's people um, kind of dressed up for a picnic. They have um, branches in their hands, apparently, for mosquitoes. And a large sandy um, um, lake bottom, and then um, ridges running north and south. Some of the ridges are still there, even though the lake isn't there. But um, and, and there's been some studies done on some of the older plants that are on the, some of those ridges. So, uh, the one the one thing I didn't say about that uh, that previous slide is that in the settlement period there was two enemies for newcomers. Basically, one was water and one was trees. And so that bucolic picture of of um, of that picnic on the um, edge of the lake 
was going to change pretty rapidly. Um, one of the really important things about the Fraser River locally uh, was the fact that it was a connector, a real connector to people. So where I live, um, you know, people in Fort Langley and Maple Ridge, Bonnock, they went back and, and forth across the river for mail, for school, for everything. Um, the Rose, this is a Rosedale Chilliwack, Fer Chilliwack Rosedale Ferry, 1917. So the river was used before bridges. Um, it's a really important point of connection. So that and that connection wasn't just um, local; it was also international. So this is the Thermopylae um, loading lumber from Surrey. It's at New Westminster loading lumber for Surrey. It's bound for China, and the. Um, back haul back to Surrey was, or back to New Westminster was rice. So um, really, uh, the Fraser River is a really powerful industrial a piece of industry. Um, I included this slide because it kind of gives in a, a, a sense of, of uh, the thinking around um, the, that settlement era. It's called American Progress. It's, it is American. Um, but it's, it's interesting. That central figure in the middle is uh, Columbia. She's supposed to stand in for the U.S. And she's moving across, to, across the West, um, carrying, uh, you know, with the telegraph wires in her hand. And the head of her are running First Nations and all um, um, bison and, and, um, and animals. So the idea was that... Um, you know, this was really the thinking of the 1860s, 1870s, and part of the underpinnings of um, how the river was going to be treated. Uh, this is New Westminster, 1860s. That really, re this is a really famous picture, which you've no doubt seen before. But what I, the reason I wanted to show it was that that really important emergence of new economies and the idea that. Uh, settlement was coming and that we need to make infrastructure really quickly um, to meet the needs of settlers and part of that was was going to be managing the river. Uh, so when we move into the slide of Chilliwack 1894, Neil's kind of given a sense of the uh, 1894 um, um, flood. The important thing about 1894 flood, this is Chilliwack downtown, was that government had spent a lot of time getting people and a lot of energy getting settlers, agricultural settlers, settled on the land in the Fraser Valley. And when the 1894 flood came, it really <clears throat> shook the confidence of government and settlers. They really began to wonder, should we really be doing this? And so <clears throat> after 1894, there was a really strong, renewed effort to... Um, to make sure that water was managed and that agricultural land was kept safe um, from the river. And so, and the other thing that happened in the early 20th century was that we could, that machinery was big enough that some of these gigantic projects could be, um, could be done. So here's Sumas Lake, the draining of Sumas Lake. Um, it, it was an important, um, the idea was that before the frontier was always ahead of us, it was always somewhere else out there, and now the frontier was close to home underneath us. We could manage land, we could manage water, we could do it all, and so that was, that was um, how we entered the 20th century. Municipalities in the early 20th century began to really work with government on the first diking system that, that, pre that was in place in 1948. And so um, it was a point of municipal pride. It was uh, important to, to settlement to have these strong dikes. In the early part of the 20th century too, you get the diking districts starting to be set up, 1910, 1911, that, pe that farmers paid into that managed the dikes. So um, that previous slide was draining Sumas Prairie, or draining Sumas Lake, and this is Sumas Prairie, 1929. So the feeling by the end of the 20s was that we had this covered, we had it dialed in, 
we had dikes, they were strong, and that we didn't really need to, you know, that we had mastered the um, art of water. You can see um, this is Chilliwack, 1948. By the time the 1948 flood comes, um, people, as Neil said, were surprised. Um, this picture I like because it shows the two waters, um, the waters of Chilliwack, um, Chilliwack River and the Fraser River, um, two different colors of water. The river in that previous picture seemed to stop at a road at the lower river. Oh, that's the, um, this is the Trans-Canada Highway? Yeah. But, yeah. but above that there, is that, the, the river just sort of, that looks like the river goes down there and just stops. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. No, the one from the bottom is blowing up. Okay. But oh, where it's coming from then, I guess it's... Yeah. So this is a slide, uh, June 5th, 1848, but actually that's a typo. 1948. Um, there was a, um, there's a whole series of these photographs from Neil's office that, um, show um, some of the flood of 1948. So this is um, Hatsik here. You can see the Hatsik break. This is Matt Squee here. And then beyond, you can see Greendale as well. So 19, the flood of 48 was really important as a kind of a community. Um, it's, a, it's a point of memory in, in terms of community. But it's also a, a time when everything, it was post-war, everything was mobilized in the service of fighting this flood and also um, um, evacuation. The ar there was army, um, every community group that was possible um, joined in. We also had the power of radio. There was a massive community effort um, and people re really remember um, that. So within one week, all the major dikes failure um, throughout the Fraser Valley. Um, and the concern with 1941, the concerns with 1948 was that Vancouver was isolated, so um, major rail and all rail and also um, and also the roads were not going through and and Airplanes, airlines was really were really sort of not able to cope with that amount of what was required. So after 1948, um, people's people had been complacent in the 20s, and after 1948, um, there was a real renewal of interest in it was necessary a real renewal interest of interest in dikes and a commitment by the federal government to create the infrastructure to, um, to control dikes. Uh, so right after, the f there was sort of three waves. Um, the dikes were fixed under the Fraser River under a three-man, three three-person um, diking uh, kind of a board. And you can see that this was, this is Hats, Hats Creek before, and that was one of the challenges, and this is the, the new dikes after. Um, so the, the dike, um, I need to go back to my notes here. Um, so immediately after the flood of 48, the dikes were fixed. Um, and then there was a, about a 50 year period when there was a federal, um, fe federal oversight and sustained funding for the diking system. And that brought real kind of, um, until 1995, that brought certainty to the diking system and certainty to the expertise that could be um, brought here. So that um, there were, there was definitely challenges throughout, but um, uh, there was that consolidation of, of effort and consolidation of knowledge, which uh, Neil came into um, the end of that. Right. So. Um, yeah, so I'm going to pass it back over to Neil now to take up that period from sort of 1995 on. Yeah, I'm going to uh, 
just introduce the concept of integrated flood management as a way of talking about this issue. Um, we're not just talking about infrastructure, we're talking about a bigger, a bigger issue of how uh, our society deals with floods. Um, and I use the word management or risk reduction rather than flood control, because control is an illusion. <laughs> um, so integrated flood management uh, is, is really three components that, that need to be thought of together. Uh, one is the dikes and the structural protection. And so, and for some river systems, like the Columbia, uh, where there's multiple storage dams, uh, that's part of it too. But on the Fraser, there's essentially uh, no flood control through uh, uh, storage dams. It's an unregulated natural system. Um, and the trouble with dikes is that they can, they can fail. And Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans was probably the most recent, uh, biggest example of that. And, um, you know, I'll get on to a little bit more about dikes. They're, they're very useful and they're important, but um, they, they can fail, they can uh, get overwhelmed um, for a number of reasons and they're not fail safe. Uh, flood hazard land use management. If we didn't live in a floodplain and there were just floods, um, there'd be no trouble at all. Um, but the trouble is, is that, of course, and Chilliwack, we're in the floodplain right where we stand here at this moment. Um, the huge economic benefits to society from these lands that we occupy. Um, we're not, we're not going to uh, move out of the floodplain at least in most places. Um, but the things we can do, we can plan developments, and this lower uh, picture here just shows new, a house in New Westminster where the main floor level of the house is above uh, the flood level. And if you've been watching the news lately about Gatineau and the, uh, the Ottawa uh, area, um, they're going to have to demolish a lot of the houses, and it's simply because of the rot and the water getting into the drywall and so on. And if you build a house with of the right materials and you have your main living area above the, above the flood level, you can just hose it out and you're back in. So there are, there are ways of designing houses that are better. Um, and of course, emergency response is the other sort of pillar of the stool. Um, that's the one we always see when the flood's happening. It's, it's critical that we we uh, evacuate people to, to save lives and, and whatever, but it doesn't stop the economic damage, it's, and it's very reactive. Still, highly important. Um, so I'll deal with the governance a bit and, and look at each of those three components separately, <coughs> first of all. Um, structural flood protection. After 1948, uh, there was provincial legislation uh, giving the province oversight over all these various, uh, more or less, agricultural, farmer-driven diking authorities. Uh, those diking authorities evolved into municipalities and, and uh, so on, but the province still retains uh, an oversight role, and there was a position, statutory position created called Inspector of Dikes, and that office uh, sets taking standards and it kind of monitors uh, what dike authorities are doing and of course it, it approves changes to dikes and new dikes. The diking authorities themselves, as I mentioned, most now are local governments. There's still some remnant diking uh, districts um, and about 500 kilometers of diking in the lower mainland and about 30 of these diking authorities. They're the ones that own the land, uh, own the dikes, or they have rights of way over the works, and they're responsible for the maintenance and management and, uh, well, basically every, everything. Uh, the province from time to time, through the Fraser River Flood Control Program and more recently through the BC Flood Protection Program, uh, provides cost-sharing funding, and this is used by Dighton authorities to uh, do major uh, they're supposed to be funding their own maintenance, but sometimes major maintenance is done under this program. Um, it's about a one-third cost share, the same as other infrastructure, federal, provincial, local. This picture is a, an example in Delta, where the corporation of Delta 
had got some funding to uh, upgrade erosion protection on their sea deck. With respect to land use management, um, there were huge changes in 2003. Uh, the provincial government uh, basically removed provincial authority to approve subdivisions and, and municipal bylaws and basically uh, allowed local government to, to retain those decisions. Uh, at the present time, the Ministry of Environment uh, has uh, legislation. They pu publish guidelines and has broad powers to establish regulations, but hasn't used that power. And under the Local Government Act, local governments are enabled to adopt floodplain bylaws. And if they do, they have to consider provincial guidelines, but they don't necessarily have to adopt bylaws. It's, it's a voluntary, not a mandatory thing. Uh, under the Land Title Act, uh, approving officers can approve subdivisions in floodplain areas, uh, and they have the option, again, it's an option, to require an engineer's report to assess the hazard. So um, it's, I'll, I'll just say that I think at, at the present time it's a very loose system. Uh, it's very uh, non-uniform. Some municipalities and regional districts are quite diligent and, and, and uh, have some fairly strong uh, uh, bylaws and so on. Uh, others do not. It's just the guidelines, and these were published in 2004, and they need updating. And the other thing that they need to be updated for, of course, is climate change and sea level rise. Just an example of how uh, pre-planning can uh, prevent flooding. This is in Delta. Uh, subdivision that was approved prior to 2003 with the Ministry of Environment's approval. The Ministry required uh, the developer to fill the area where the houses were being built. The road was still kept low. Uh, and this area has actually flooded a couple of times since these houses were built and there has been no, no damage. The road gets flooded, but who cares? <coughs> uh, emergency response and preparedness is, again, that very uh, important. Uh, there's an emergency program act in BC. It sets out what different ministries do and what local governments do. Uh, it can provide extraordinary powers during an emergency. In our, uh, uh, the mayor can declare a flood of, uh, an emergency and, and then you can get access through private land and so on. Um, another important piece is uh, what happens after in terms of compensation and disaster financial assistance. Again, in the news from Ontario, it's funny in Quebec they only get two hundred thousand. In BC we get three hundred thousand, um, so it's not quite uniform across the country. Um, this is a really important thing because local governments approve developments, and senior governments pay the bill for the possibly unwise decisions. There's no linkage there at the present time. The federal government is realizing they're paying out billions and billions, and the curve goes way up every year, particularly with the Alberta floods. Um, they're trying to get the private insurance industry involved, but they're not so keen until they know where the, hazard, where the risks are. So some companies are offering uh, residential flood insurance, but it's still very uncertain, and sometimes the premiums are really large if you're actually in a pretty hazardous area. Yeah, on the previous slide, that design level, how often is that assessed? The two, two or yeah, the one before that? Yeah. How often is that design flood level assessed? Um, that, that would be a 200-year a, a level plus freeboard. Or, or um, I th no, actually, I, th I think that, that one was just a flood level without freeboard. That would be 2.9 2 meters in, in delta. So it's high tide. Uh, a normal high tides without the storm surge is, is about uh, two meters. So it's another meter higher than... than that design level, that, you know, that was stated for years, 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 years. That's without sea level rise. That's yeah. the, this, this development was built in the 90s. Um, again, flood warning is really critical and, and we're fortunate in BC to have an excellent river forecast center. Um, they have a... a a network of, of snow survey sites, and, and this is just kind of a, 
for the freezers, I mentioned there's two things that cause a flood, it's snow melt and then it's the weather, how fast the snow melts and whether there's rain involved. Snow is only part of the picture, but, but it's an important part of the picture. And in 2007, where we had a lot of interest, we had a record snowpack throughout most of the Fraser Basin, and that's sort of on, on the left there, you can see where there's over 140% of, of normal snow. This year the pattern is different. Um, it's sort of heavier snow in the, like where the trouble is in the Okanagan here with, with high snowpacks. This is May 15th. Um, it's more overall an average snowpack year, but still again, it's the weather, it's how fast things melt and whether there's rain, whether we get a flood or not. Um, the other thing, I, there's lots to mention about what the River Forecast Center does, but I'll just mention one more thing because we are in the Fraser Valley, is that uh, the province uh, operates a, a computer model from, from Hope to Richmond that uh, puts in the forecast flows and, and uh, produces water levels. So this only happens when the emission gauge is, is uh, above about 5.5 meters, but over 60 locations along the river, the, the water levels are, are uh, published and forecasted. And this is really important so that each diving authority, if they understand this stuff, they can figure out how much freeboard they're going to have on the dike uh, maybe two days from now and that kind of thing and help them assess the local risk. Um, the objectives of flood response. Um, number one is safety for the responders and, and of course the populace, reduce suffering. Way down on the list is reduce economic social losses. So again, having a great emergency response plan is really important, but it's not going to save you money. Um, now I'll get on to uh, what's happened with the, the dikes at the present time. And um, one, one of the last projects that I was involved in before I retired from my position with the province was to uh, organize this uh, Lower Mainland Dike Assessment um, where the dikes in the Lower Fraser were looked at not in a lot of detail, but using uh, existing information uh, to, to, to look at, at the, the, their height relative to the design levels, their geometry with respect to uh, geotechnical stability, whether there are erosion problems, uh, vegetation or animal uh, control problems, encroachments from buildings or, 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 or business that would interfere with dike operation structures, that's referring to the pump stations and the flood boxes that are through the dikes and, and the general operation and maintenance and, and uh, a matrix was developed to, to rate these um, characteristics and then all the dikes were kind of rated. And when I say a dike, a dike means a connection from high ground to high ground. So whether it's one kilometer long or 30 kilometers long or like Nakoman Island where it's I think 35 kilometers all the way around. That's one one day. So it's it's a connection from high ground to high ground. Um, and what do we find? Well, the dikes generally don't meet current provincial standards, and and none fully meet or exceed the standards. And 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 the big problem uh, is, of course, that some of them, most of them, are low relative to the current design levels, and many of them are unstable and approximately more than two-thirds might be expected to be overtopped if we had a recurrence of the 1894 flood and maybe a third of them might fail through uh, stability or seepage problems rather than by overtopping. So if we have our design flood, uh, it, the, the dikes are generally not going to perform very well. Um, this is just a map from the report. Um, you can see Nakoman Island, um, particular, um, and uh, even even Chilliwack, who has done a lot of proactive work over the last several years in, in um, upgrading sections here of the East Dyke. Um, there, there's still some issues, and again, we're we're looking at a whole dike. So even though you've raised part of it here, um, it's not. It's still because we're kind of lumping 
a whole dike. It's the weakest point that really has to govern. So, so why, why is this sort of negative assessment? One of the main reasons is, is, is simply uh, evolvement of engineering science. Um, we've used the 1894 flood event as, as our design value, and the engineers, when they're doing the Fraser River Flood Control Program, they used up high water levels that were along the river and at, and at mission, rec actually recorded at mission. And of course, that's an unconfined situation, and they didn't have good computer models. The Fraser River is a big river. It's, it's up to three kilometers wide. It's a complex channel. It just wasn't the tools to analyze it. So now we have really amazing uh, LIDAR. Uh, we, we've got elevations every, every meter. We've got high-powered computers. And um, we can do a much, much better job of figuring out how, how the water levels. And basically, in a, in a nutshell, um, we're almost a meter higher because of these effects. And, and of course, there hasn't been the program since the Fraser River. This, this information has only come out after the Fraser River Fund Control Program. And we haven't had an organized program to, do, to, do, to meet the new so level. Did you say that, that the 1894 level would be, at the same conditions, it would be a meter higher? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, and, and this, is sort of, this is sort of a bit of a cartoon of why. Um, you got two effects. One, one is that the water doesn't run into the floodplains anymore, and if it flood, runs into the floodplains, it gets stored there, and it, it sort of takes away the flow from the main river, and so it can be lower. And then, of course, the other thing is, is with the dike channel, um, there are areas where the water would have been flowing down the valley that can't flow down the valley anymore. So it, again, it, it forces more water into a smaller space, and the levels are higher. And, and just to give you an example of, of that, what happened in 48, of that kind of effect, this, this is Agassiz here, looking Paris and Lake. And in 1948, the water came across through Agassiz, flowed down slope, and exited through Harrison Hot Springs into Harrison Lake. So that took quite a bit of water way out of the, <coughs> out of the main channel. And of course, now, if hoping our dikes and Agassiz will hold, um, that wouldn't happen. So what are, what are the key challenges for dikes? Um, as I mentioned, um, from an engineering perspective, it's a rotten design. It's, it's a rotten design. I mean, you, you've got uh, a 10-kilometer thing with, with uh, variable soil conditions. It's not a highly engineered structure. A lot of variability. Um, there's lots of stuff through it. You've got to address the weakest links. So you can have a Beautiful dike, and if you have one weak spot, the rest of it's useless. Um, you have to consider all the modes of failure, not, not just overtopping. Um, and I mentioned variable soil conditions. I think one of the key things is that because we get these big floods so rarely, um, the existing river dikes haven't been tested. There hasn't been water up against them. So when we do get water up against them, it's going to be really interesting because we're going to see boils and seepage and Stuff, and some of that stuff is going to be able to flood fight, and, and other stuff not. But you don't know where the problems are going to develop until the water level comes up. And we've got all these structures through the dikes, um, thousands of buried utility crossings, particularly in Richmond, where there's been development near the dikes. Um, these are potential weak links where the water can find its way along the buried pipes and things like that. And then another huge, huge challenge is if we need bigger dikes, they're going to be bigger, and they need a bigger footprint. And the land is so valuable in the Fraser Valley, not just in Metro Vancouver, um, that how do you build a bigger dike in an urban setting? Now, we're running out of time. I better move along quickly here. Um, I'm just going to talk about mitigating risk, climate change, earthquakes, and then a, a few points about what I think we need to do. This looks a bit complicated, but it's really not. Um, risk is, is defined as the uh, probability times consequences, so it's sort of like an equation. In other words, what's the chance of something happen, and if it does happen, how, how bad is it? And that defines your risk. And so increasing risk is the, the, the red stuff above the equation. It's like sea level rise and increased flows from climate change and, and sedimentation and changes in the river 
subsidence, aging infrastructure, seismic, that changes the chance of a, a dike failing. And then if the dike fails, what's the consequences? Well, the more development we have in the floodplain, obviously, the more, the higher the risk. So how do you control that? What are the things we can do to reduce the risk? And it's really building higher dikes. Um, storage dams on the Fraser, which have been a non-starter so far and may, and, and may continue to be. So really, one of the things, and I had already mentioned disaster management, really doesn't stop the flooding, it just gets people out of the way. So it really, it's this, it's this land use stuff that, that has the most potential uh, for benefit, but is also the hardest to implement. And with uh, climate change, uh, <coughs> Sea level rise is a, is a big issue, particularly for the sea dikes. And, and I'll maybe move through this. Um, the sea level rise does affect flood levels, even during a big flood as far upstream as Mission. Um, we may get a, in the order of a, a meter by the year 2100, in comparison to the year 2000, that it's, uh, well, if you're into sea level rise science, that's an interesting field in itself. We know the sea level rise is going to happen, it's just how fast. Um, the other thing that's of interest is, is the, are the size of floods on the Fraser going to change? And uh, we've done some studies through the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium in Victoria. And um, the indication is that this is from downscaling uh, these global climate models and, and uh, running uh, hydrological models for the Fraser, it, 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 there is a more, more, more likely chance of increasing rather than decreasing, even though the snowpacks may be lower in the future. It's just because of higher rates of melt with higher temperatures and increased precipitation because warmer air can hold more moisture. So we're looking at peak flows that might be up to 10 to 20 percent greater, levels that could be up to a meter higher than our current design level, and major floods could, could occur more light, more, uh, more frequently. But again, this is pretty uncertain at this point. Uh, regardless of the climate change factor, from the previous assessment of dikes, it's clear that we need uh, a, a major dike upgrading program anyway. Another complicating factor is uh, seismicity, and uh, the south coast of British Columbia is a high seismic area. Um, the dikes are in absolutely the wrong, the worst place. Uh, if they're on the top of a river bank, and you're, you have relatively loose sand layer somewhere in the foundation underneath, it's not the dike that's the problem, it's the foundation underneath. Um, when it gets shaped, it, it turns to a fluid. And of course, because you're on a river bank, you have the gravitational force um, wanting that slope to, to fail and slide into the river. This is just an, a little example in New Zealand uh, of, of that type of thing occurring on a dike. And um, if we do get a major quake in, in this area, whether it's in Fraser Valley or, 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 or one of the larger ones offshore, we're going to see a lot of damage to the dikes. So the, the problem is not so much we're going to get immediate flooding, uh, because a flood and an earthquake aren't likely to happen at the same time. But it's, we've in, if we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars, or if not billions of dollars into this infrastructure, how are we going to repair it? And how, how can we rely on it if it's got cracks and, uh, and so on? So that's the issues. And, um, one solution, and this is only where you have major redevelopment happening near the dike, such as in Richmond, is to build a super dike. In other words, uh, just build a massive fill and incorporate it into your development and whatever. So if there's cracking or sloughing on the outer slope, it doesn't really matter, or you know the, the the fill is massive enough, and build it into your development as opposed to a separate narrow structure. So I'll get on to the final. I think we're okay. just about out of time here. Okay. Um, so what what do we need to do? And uh, I tried to pick up just 
just the, the really key key things. Um, with respect to the province, uh, I worked for them for a long time, and and, and uh, you know, uh, in many respects, there were lots of good things that were done. Um, but I think at this point, it's lost its focus. And and uh, Jane mentioned how the 48 flood really focused efforts for almost, <coughs> almost 50 years. Um, I think we've lost that. And one piece of evidence is that is that we have four ministries that that are responsible for flood man bits of flood management. Nobody's really in charge. Um, so I think reorganizing and, and, and the province becoming a strong lead is, is really critical. Um, I, everything happens at the local government level. So it's local governments that are the doers. And with support from the province, each local government needs to develop an integrated plan. And I underline the word integrated because again, um, you don't want to focus your land use intensification in an area where you know that you can't uh, build, build a high quality dike or that the dike is a problem with the dike. Um, so you have to integrate the different aspects of your structural and your land use regulation and of course also the emergency response plans. And that plan has to be based on really good solid hazard information. This effort to redo floodplain maps is excellent, but it's only good if that information is used. The federal government is key in supporting this process, um, but as I mentioned earlier, this disaster financial assistance now tends to incentivize people to build in hazard areas, and then when they when they get flooded, they, 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 they get bailed out. Um, so that has to change a little bit in terms of how that's incorporated uh, maybe uh, communities shouldn't be eligible for disaster assistance until they've got one of these plans, uh, something like that. Uh, but again, the federal government has a key role in terms of supporting the provinces. So I think that's, um, let's see. So, uh, Back to Jane. Uh, the picture that we tried to paint, the picture that we were trying to paint uh, through this um, talk was, the idea of, um, you know, what can we do now? What, what's the situation now? That's Neil's piece. And also, um, how, how much thinking has changed over time? So when we first, when settlement first came to the Fraser Valley, the idea was we could control the river. And now that, and we could control our environment really, really well. Um, time has passed and we've realized that we can't. So what are the other, what's the whole complex? And so Neil has talked about the integrated um, management approach. So I don't know, I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Yeah, we have a few minutes, yeah. So thank you very much, thank you to Neil.